In this video, I will be discussing the introduction into the fourth stance. And the fourth stance is standing stable on two feet, transferring to one foot, moving sideward to move to another location on the floor. Everything with the four stance is sideways. And with that, we're going to be using the inside pressure of one foot to move our body onto the other foot and then come back onto two feet. So the inside pressure on your feet, everybody is very familiar with that because whenever we are standing on two feet, and this includes anybody, whenever we're standing on two feet, the pressure is always located towards the inside of the feet. That's because our body is centered right here. That pressure is pushing down to the floor here. But our feet being off-centered, the pressure in the feet is split into two different components. A big component is pushing straight down to the floor. Another smaller component is pushing out to the sides of the floor. So when you add those pressure forces together, you get the resultant pressure, which is pushing at an angle. Now, the further apart you have your feet, the more pressure you have on the insides of your feet, and the more you're going to be pushing your feet to the sides. If you want to prove this to yourself, go stand on a very slippery surface like ice that is very smooth. Put a little water on top of it just to make it even more slick. And try to stand with your feet wide apart. Well, you're going to be doing the splits very quickly because the, each foot is functionally angled this way and it's both feet are pushing out to the side. Both feet are pushing and holding your body into the middle. Now, when you're on that slippery ice, it's not such a good thing. But when you're on a surface where your feet don't slide, it's a very good thing for those people that have a problem stabilizing on their feet. So now, instead of just the feet slipping out to the side, they held right there. So now we're using that pressure to push our body here. And that's why people stand with their feet wider apart. Now, this is where I'm going to, again, contradict what is stated in the medical literature. The medical literature says that those of us with a cerebellar pathology, or in our case, a shrinking cerebellum, when we have a problem with our cerebellum, that causes our feet to be spread wider apart, this wider gait with the cerebellar disease. Well, I'm here to argue that it's not because of that happening so much. It's what's happening with our stability down here. For example, here when we're standing, that pressure mostly is going straight down. There's a little bit sideways, but not much. And you can prove that to yourself by standing here with your feet close together. Don't change anything with your posture. Just stand here and force one foot up. And that inside pressure that's still on the inside of that foot pushes your body over to the side. The only way you can stay here is shifting your shoulders over a little bit, which means your whole body, by the way, to center that pressure over one foot to be able to stay there. So whenever we're on two feet, the pressure is always towards the inside of our feet. Okay, now back to the cerebellar disease and the widened feet scenario. I have a shrinking cerebellum. And if the cerebellum is totally responsible for me not being able to stand with my feet close together, if that caused my feet to go further and further apart, I should be falling over right now. So, why do we spread our feet further and further apart? Well, again, as we become more clumsy and more stiffened up here and our posture changes, to compensate for that without realizing it and knowing what we're doing, we are gradually spreading our feet to compensate for that. 
we're innately starting to use more and more of the pressure on the inside of our feet to stabilize us. That's why we use increased pressure more and more on our feet to stabilize our erotic posture because that's where we're the most stable. We can't control this. To be able to control ourselves here, we have to have that increasing pressure pushing down into our feet. Well, remember we talked about how we stop pushing pressure down into our feet because our posture becomes more erratic. The pressure is changing on our feet. So if we hold that pressure down into our feet, we're going to be pushing ourselves further and further out of balance and into trouble. So we innately stop pushing and we start doing this stuff, trying to stabilize ourselves through stiffening, which doesn't work. So with that, without realizing it, the feet start coming further and further apart. So yes, there is something going on with the cerebellum in this case, but the reason that we're spreading our feet apart is not because of this, it's because of the instability down there. Now you can argue chicken, egg, and all this kind of stuff, but this is the chicken and the egg. Here, your feet functionally are out this way. Increased pressure in one is pushing out. Increased pressure in the other is pushing out the opposite way. And they're both pushing this way, which pushes your body to the center, which is more stable. And you'll see some people walking around this way with this stiffened posture, and they're pretty stable. Because they're moving from this inside pressure to that inside pressure. And that pressure, as they move over, notice they don't move over onto this flat foot. They rock, staying on that increased pressure. So when they rock over here, it rocks them right back, or pushes them right back. And that's how they move around. So to correct that, and to be able to bring your feet back in, you have to learn how to control your posture and the pressures in your feet. You cannot do that just by walking practice or standing practice, that type of thing, because you don't know what you're doing. Some of you have gone through that and you've gotten a little bit better, but you can't keep it because you don't know what you're doing. You don't know why you're able to stand there after you practice it for a while. You lose it and then you end up back here. The only way to get this Widen base stance to decrease. I don't care if it's standing, walking, whatever you want, even getting up from a chair, I don't care. The only way you correct this is learning how to stabilize and use this pressure better, transfer your body weight, and control where that pressure is on your feet. Doesn't matter what your cerebellum is or is not. If it's true that it's your cerebellum, I couldn't be doing this and I couldn't be doing that because mine is shrinking like a lot of yours. So, what do we need to focus on to be able to bring those feet closer together, to be able to stand on that one foot when things are not so comfy cozy up here yet? Well, for one, this is not something brand new. Yes, we're adding on to what you've been doing, but everything we've done from standing upright to getting down on the floor and back up, all of that stuff has been preparing you for this. And this, learning this, will prepare you for all the other stuff to come. So, you already know how to do more of this than you think. All of that stuff you continue using. You already see, you know, even with your feet right here, you need to still transfer pressure over into, more into this foot to be able to lift that foot. Now, in the first three stances, we've been talking about make your feet flat. Get 
the shoulders forward, bringing pressure off your heel, moving it forward to get it in your flat foot to be equal between the ball area and the heel area. Okay, well that still applies because the first part of going through this first stance is going to be keeping your feet flat on the floor to use the entire length to have the most stability. But now, as we're balancing on this one foot to be able to lift this other foot off the floor to go where we want to go here, we now have to work with moving that pressure through the narrow part of our foot or from side to side. That's a little bit unnerving because there isn't much space there. Moving it from front to back, the length of our foot is a lot more than the width of our foot. So now things become a little bit more precarious to where you have to have better control. Better control of your posture, better relaxation, better control of the pressures in your feet. To relax in them, coordinated counterbalancing posture. So, to be able to play with that pressure moving across your foot, some of you are going to need help. You're going to need help by having something that you can help stabilize you while you're doing it. So let me bring up a chair. This is okay. My problems are only mild, but when you have more of a problem, this is probably not going to be stable enough for you. If you have more of a problem, you're probably going to be pushing this aside. You're going to have it here and your shoulders will tend to get back, which will get you on your heels. If you have a little bit forward, you're pushing it forward because you're leaning into it too much. All sorts of problems. You need something that's stable. And how about back of a couch? Pretty heavy and stable, a big easy chair, whatever. The kitchen counter that you can lean on, any kind of a stable table. You can even get up to a wall and do it this way, whatever, as we've done in some other videos before or started to get into with some uh, weight shifting there in the hallway. You can back up to the corner in one of the rooms you have, and then the corner over here, the wall right behind you, and you can actually put your bottom on the wall if you want. Your feet are going to have to be a little bit closer than the one foot length that we used before. So then your bottom on the wall will help stabilize you back there. And then that corner is going to be there in case you tip over because you move too far onto the outside of your foot. There are all sorts of ways you can do it to help stabilize yourself. Find what works for you. But the biggest thing you have to do is be able to not depend on that. Or at least not overly depend on it in the beginning. You have to wean yourself off of this. So in the beginning, you're going to want to have this close enough where you're not leaning over there because that really defeats the purpose. So for those of you with a mild problem, you're standing here and you want this just comfortably right here. Now, when you transfer body weight over, you're going to be here. You could be able to get this knee up to be able to stand here. So that's about how far you want the chair away. And my other problem, you want this a little bit forward. Why? Because you want to work on also keeping these shoulders forward. So keeping your hand down here helps you remind yourself to do just that. So now you're up here working on pushing that pressure into this flattened foot across the foot and front and back. Now while I'm thinking about it, we work on reducing the fear of getting that pressure out forward. Now we have to get you over the fear of having that pressure here on the outside. That's a nasty place to fall because there's nothing there to catch you unless you're right there against the wall or somebody else as strong enough to hold you up. But you don't like having that pressure on the outside of your foot and standing here on both feet, becoming very comfortable with this 
added increased pressure on the inside of your feet. Coming over here to the outside of your foot where you typically have not had pressure is a scary thing. Now let's add another little scary part to that. You've been on the inside and towards your heels, most of you. Now you're going to be on that flattened foot, pressure forward off your heel, partially on the front of your foot, and you're going to be on the outside of your foot. The biggest issue you're going to have here is, whether you consciously know it or, or not, is in the pinky toe area of your foot because that is the least supportive of our foot. That's the, the area where that we use the least amount. But that's where you now need to feel pressure. And any kind of pressure there, even just a little bit, for those of you that have this problem with your posture, you're going to wig out. Not wig out up here, but you're going to withdraw from it without even realizing you're doing it. So you have to be comfortable with getting pressure in that pinky toe area of your foot. And when it's there, when you can feel that, that's pretty much where you need to be. In fact, that's where many of you need to focus your attention to getting that pressure there to be able to stand on that one foot. Now. Don't be alarmed and ticked off at yourself if you're having problems standing on one foot. Because some people with natural ability have the same issue for the same exact reasons. Not with this restrictive posture, but because they're on the inside of their foot. They don't transfer enough weight over to be able to center on that foot to stand on it. All you have to do is watch a class of people practicing yoga, there are some that are just perfect. They get over on their foot and they stand there and they just piece of cake. And there are others that they can't get there. They, they keep mostly falling back onto this foot. Oh, I just can't get it. Oh, those people are so gifted that can do it. Well, yes, they are, but no, they're not. They're gifted in the fact that they can relax and stabilize over that perfectly flat foot with the even pressure perfectly spread throughout the foot and just relax into that. Have better balance, better coordination than a lot of us. You can do this much better than you think. That natural person with the perfect balance in the yoga pose on one foot is the exact same place where you need that pressure. You're not doing anything different. What that person with the great posture and the great pose is doing on one foot, they have all this pressure pushing down and they have the coordination and balance to hold it right there over that one place in their, in their foot. and they're great with it. You have to do the same thing for the exact same reasons. Now, you'll see them staying up here and then moving on to a foot, and they're standing upright. Oh my God, I just did that too. Wait a minute. I have SCA 14 and part of my brain stem and cerebellum are shrinking. I can't stand on one foot because. I have to stand with my feet wider apart because my cerebellum is, see where I'm going with that? Yes, I was a bit facetious with it, but that's my big point. You can do much more than you think you could do if you just get off your tuckus and start practicing this stuff and finding out how you can do things better. So you, Many of you, brother, are not going to be able to just stand here and get up there on one foot. Many of you are going to have to be down here in, the, in a ready stance and exaggerate that to get that pressure down there, to get these muscles working a little 
better to learn how to push that pressure there while you're standing on one foot, keep that knee relaxed, keep your posture relaxed, and all that stuff we've been working on, just to be able to do it. Then gradually, you'll be able to straighten up and do the exact same thing. As you learn how to control those pressures in your feet, keeping the pressure pushing down in your feet, and controlling this posture to relax into all of that stuff. It's always the same thing over and over and over again. The only difference is it becomes a little bit more complex. So you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be getting better, better, better. You have to be doing all of this just a little bit better. That's the theme throughout all of this. Nothing special. So with this, how do you wean yourself off this chair or anything else you're using? You have to use this to be able to test yourself. And by that, I mean, you're standing here and you go, ah, oh, that feels pretty good, that feels pretty good, and then feel how much pressure you have pushing into this hand, or both hands, whatever. If you're feeling pressure there, then you're not as good as you think you're doing on that. Better than what you were, but only when you're standing here and you can Remove that pressure, and notice how I was gradually, whoop, pressure was towards the inside. So you're teaching yourself with this stabilizing hold that you have, or not hold, but contact. You're teaching yourself where these pressures actually are. Oh, there it is. And you're going to feel, and if you were watching my foot there, you can see it was moving a little bit down here. You're going to have that happen as you go through this. It's no great big deal, but learn how to stabilize that. Oh, inside, you're going to be a little bit too far. You go oh, to the outside. Keep this elbow flexed to be able to help you with your changing posture. Test yourself. Only when you're able to stand there and lift your hand and remain there, that's the only time that that is exactly where it's supposed to be. So teach yourself, train yourself, learn these pressures. Because everything you want to do is about that. Everything. That's what you have to be comfortable with. So when you want to stand on one foot, ah, oh, that's where it needs to be. Oh, there it is. If this is correct, this will be correct. If this is correct, this is relaxed. That's all you need to know. So putting all this stuff that you're learning up here together to make sense of it, you have to be using it. So the sense is, this is how it feels. This is what I need to do down here. And this is why. All the same thing off and over again. Everything comes back to where is the pressure located in your feet, and especially the increased pressure. Because that pressure is what determines where your body is subject to move or where it's about to move your body in which direction, how fast and how much. It's all about where that increased pressure is in your foot. It's not any more difficult than that. But getting to the point where you can control yourself on that that's the tricky part. It takes a while. It takes a lot of practice, and it takes doing it over and over and over and over again. That's why I've said before that everything I do movement-wise, it's all therapy. If I'm having a good day and doing what I want to do, I'm not thinking about it just like a normal person or a person with natural ability. I'm not thinking about it. Well, when I start to have some little things, I focus on the little points that I need to remind myself of to do it better. So it's okay to make mistakes. Learn from them. The mistakes are teaching points. Okay, why did I make that mistake? What do I need to do to stop making that mistake to control it a little bit better? Ah, okay, it's all therapy. And if you can look at your world 
that way, it'll help ease the burden up here about thinking of all these ideas of how bad you are, what you can't do, and what you're jealous of not having anymore. You can look at it as, I'm better than what I was. And if I keep doing this stuff, I'll be even more better. I'll be able to perfect my movements even more. How much? I don't know, but I know that the more I gain, the better I am. And then it's just the next step, the next step, the next step. You have to find out, whoa, I'm pushing the chair. I tried to go on the one foot there, and what did I do wrong? I didn't transfer enough over onto this left foot. I was still in this chair and I pushed it away. Okay, so what I need to do is not pull the chair closer to me to be able to do this because look how I'm now leaning into that chair. I can leave it over there, but I need to shift my body over here to be able to do that. It's okay to use these things to help you support and however much you want to do during your daily routine, whatever you're doing. I don't care. Make yourself comfortable. You're going to have to quote unquote cheat sometimes. It doesn't matter. But when you're practicing on how to perfect this, then it really does matter. We can all do better. We all get to the point where we slack off at times. But then those of us that have these neurodegenerative issues, when we slack off, our movements start to slack off. In other words, we become more clumsy. There are things that we start to lose the freedom of doing. So you have to work on this stuff almost every day until it becomes more natural to keep doing it day better without having to do it every day. You're going to find out what you need to do to keep up with your program. And it, initially, I was just like you. I had to work and work and work at it every day. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, the same thing you're thinking. I would stop doing it for a couple of days, and I'd come back and try to do the same thing. And it was like I had never done it before, and I'm trying to relearn it. But then gradually, as you just relax and, and work through it, you haven't lost anything. It's like when you get sick, you become clumsy. You haven't lost your ability. People with natural ability, they also go through that. But when they get better, their movements return, and so will yours. It's just we're a little more labile than they are. It's a little bit more touchy. We're sitting there on the fence, teetering. So don't worry about that so much. Just do the best you can. Use this therapy every day. I do, still. Your therapy doesn't have to be all that great. Whatever works for you, whatever level you are working to achieve, you can surprise yourself a great deal when you get out of here, more into down here in the feet, control them. Control your posture. It can be done. Find how much of it you are able to achieve for yourself.